Welcome everyone to this uh, video series on natural language processing and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to jump straight in to a little example of where we use natural language processing today. Let's see if this works. What's the weather like in Cape Town today? Today's forecast for Cape Town is 22 degrees and partly cloudy. What about tomorrow? Tomorrow's forecast for Cape Town is 15 degrees with rain. Now, that little example actually illustrated a whole natural language processing pipeline. And it's quite intense if you actually think about what went into the Google system that had to answer the questions like that. So let's just think that through that a little bit. So I gave the system an utterance. I asked a question, what's the weather in Cape Town today? And in most systems, what would happen is the speech would get processed through something called an acoustic model. The acoustic model would produce an output sequence of something called phones. Um, so these are the smallest units that's used in um, languages. And then typically what you would do is you would process the sequence of phones through something called a lexicon. So a lexicon, you can think of that as a dictionary of the words in the language and how the different units are stitched together to form words. So out of this little block, you would get words or maybe subword units, and that would then get fed into a little block called a language model. So a language model um, at a high level tells us how words are likely to follow each other. And you can think of it in, as incorporating things like syntax, which tells us how words are stitched together, the rules of a language, the gra grammar. And then at the even higher level, maybe the semantics, which relates to the meaning of words. The output from the language model would probably get fed into a common component called the dialogue manager. And that really manages the interaction between the language model and the knowledge base. Um, so I drew the little Wikipedia logo here. But here, really, this would be Google querying information about, for example, the weather. And then you go in the reverse. So then Google will have to go back. It would have to figure out, OK, well, this is the weather in Cape Town and this is how I'm going to present it. So that would mean in this case, generating the little sequence of words. And you would hear that Google actually spoke back to me. OK, so if you have that sequence of words that Google wants to speak back, we actually want to convert that back into a waveform that gets played back to the user. Um, now we've got the sequence of words, but that actually isn't enough information to convey everything that we need uh, to generate a waveform. So um, we would probably pass that or incorporate that with a prosodic modeling component. And that does things like insert rhythm and intonation and stress, um, which you don't get just from the words. So maybe the prosodic modeling block outputs things that look like phones again, these little units of language, and then that gets passed into a waveform generation module that then outputs the waveform that I can listen to. And the cool thing is that I asked one question, what's the weather like in Cape Town today? And then I actually asked a follow-up question, which was, um, what about tomorrow? And we went through the whole pipeline again. And this relates to something called discourse. So discourse is basically more than one sentence, you know, having a a little discussion that includes more than one round of input output. I also have here on the diagram something called pragmatics and that relates to things like the co context in which we, you're using language, the social setting, and that's also some sometimes an area that gets studied. So I just briefly want to run through that again and just unpack things a little bit more. So let's just go from the bottom to the top and out again. Um, when you pass the speech through the acoustic model, I said it basically very often breaks up the speech stream into the smallest units that's used in a language. And we call these units phones. And they are normally language independent. In other words, all languages on earth um, use a set of phones. And you can actually, regardless of the language, if you're a linguist and you know the international phonetic alphabet, then if I give you an utterance, even if it's in a language that you don't know, you would, with a bit of training or a lot of training, be able to write down the phones for that, um, for, for that input utterance. And um, 
the study of phones is called phonetics. Here, what I wrote down here is phonology. Okay, so what's that? So there's phones, and then there's something called phonemes. Now, phonemes are actually language dependent or language specific. Um, so as a as a kind of a common example of this, you would have Japanese speakers who, um, if I say r and l, those two phones doesn't convey a distinction in, in, in Japanese. And so whether you say r or l, those two sounds won't be distinct phonemes in, in Japanese. Uh, another common example of, of this is in English. So in English, if I say um, thin or I say fin, those two things are two distinct words. So th and f are two distinct phonemes in English. But in many languages um, around the world, actually th and f won't represent distinct um, um, phonemes. So in Afrikaans, if you say fint um, or you say thint, it sounds a little bit weird to an Afrikaans speaker, but you didn't actually change the meaning of a word. So th and f in Afrikaans aren't distinct phonemes. I hope this is somewhat subtle, but I hope that gives you basically an idea of what happens here at the bottom. And, and the study of um, phonemes is called phonology. Now, if you have all these phonemes, then the lexicon basically tells you in this particular language that I'm looking at, how are words written in this language? What's the dictionary of words and what are the phonemes that a particular word consists of? What's that sequence? Out of the lexicon, we have words and subwords, and I said that just at high level, the words are subwords would then get processed through something called the language model. And the language model basically tells you how words are stringed together in this particular language. So, of course, that relates to syntax, the grammar of that specific language. And then at an even higher level, we have um, semantics relating to the meaning of words. Okay, now all of this is kind of encompassed in, in pragmatics, which deals with the context and the social setting in which a specific discussion um, is occurring. So all of this obviously happens within a particular context. In the example that I gave, that context was, I want to know the weather from Google, right? But um, if you study pragmatics, maybe you're studying how humans communicate in, in different um, social settings. Okay, then the reverse, I've spoken about this. Um, we query the knowledge base, the dialogue manager says, okay, this is the information that I want to convey. And then you've got a little ge language generation component that kicks out words. Words by themselves don't convey everything that we need in order to synthesize speech. So we might want to model rhythm and intonation and stress as some of the additional things that we want to capture in our final waveform here. So we need a prosodic modeling block. And then out comes phone, phone units again, and then we pass that through a waveform generation, which then kicks back the response. And then if I ask another question, then we've got another round of this and, and we have discourse. And now the first time I actually saw a, um, a Google demo like that, what amazed me was actually this discourse component, the fact that um, it, it kept track of the previous question I asked when it responded with the last question. So I asked, what's the weather like in Cape Town today? And um, gave me the weather. And then I said, what about tomorrow? And from the context, it had to figure out, oh, um, this guy is talking about Cape Town specifically. And it knew um, to, I didn't even ask for the weather. I just said, what about tomorrow? So it knew I was talking about the weather and it knew it, I was thinking about Cape Town and in that way it was able to generate the right response. Today, I mean, if we look at this, we, we've seen this so often now and we're so used to it that we don't think how amazing this is. Now, of course, in the, the last few years, everyone have been talking about um, ChatGPT and GPT, this generative pre-trained transform-based language model. And in a, in a weird way, GPT actually encompasses more or less the top part here and it's all kind of glued together in, in, in one model, where the model was trained on the internet or large parts of the internet. And so it actually contains the knowledge base. And because of the way it was trained, it's actually trained as a language model. It's also able to generate uh, to generate language. So like, I don't know, you can write here GPT. 
but it's still good to know about these like individual blocks and to think about the internal processes that something like um, GPT is going through. Now what I summarized here is really a complete language processing pipeline. Um, but what is natural language processing? Is, is, does it encompass all of these things or is it just some of the um, components? And the, the terminology here is sometimes somewhat confusing because often when we talk about natural language processing, that refers specifically to text processing, which you can think of as the top part here. And that would be distinct from speech processing, which would maybe deal with um, this part here, which would be speech recognition or maybe unit extraction. And then here, which would be speech synthesis or um, speech generation. So it can be a little bit confusing, you know, what, what is meant with all of these things. But one definition of natural language processing is that it aims to enable computers to process human language in order to perform useful tasks. And like I said, very often it refers specifically to written language, um, symbolic processing, which you very often differentiate from spoken language processing. Now, closely related to natural language processing is the area of computational linguistics. Now, computational linguistics, the goal is somewhat different. Here, the goal is to use computers to better understand the principles of human language. Okay, so it's not necessarily to solve a particular engineering task. Um, uh, we actually want to understand um, the processes of, of language better. And this means there's a somewhat more scientific goal rather than an engineering or a task focus. But this also often operates on, on text. And that means that natural language processing and computational linguistics are very often closely tied together. And you can see this from the, from the names of the biggest conferences. So NLP conferences have names like ACL, which is the Association for Computational Linguistics, and then EACL, the European chapter of the Association of the Computational Linguistics, and NACL, North American ACL. Um, and so you can see that computational linguistics, like asking these scientific questions, and natural language processing, asking um, more engineering task-focused questions, they're quite closely um, coupled. And many people will actually not distinguish between them. One distinction that most people in this field would make is the distinction between text processing and then spoken language processing or speech processing. And that deals specifically with continuous signals. And in most cases, that actually means mapping a speech waveform to, to some units, which would be recognition, or the, the opposite, where you have some units and you're trying to generate a waveform again. And the speech people have their own conferences, things like um, interspeech, and, and the other one, big one, there's a few. Uh, the other big one is ICOSP, the International Conference on Acoustics, signal and speech processing, I think. I always swap the two S's. There are also smaller conferences like ASRU and SLT. Um, but you can see that the speech people very often are tied to, to signal processing and that's somewhat distinct from the um, text, text processing communities. Of course, all of these things overlap and there's often people spanning these communities and, and working together. And so this isn't really strict definitions, but I hope that gives you a feel. If you hear these different terms being used, that you've got a feel for what they mean and what they refer to. Just a few more um, examples of uh, NLP applications. I mean, it spans a broad uh, range of things, but things like spam detection, I've got, if I've got an email in, is the spam or not? That's a binary classification task. There are also finer grained text classification tasks. Um, for instance, if you use Grammarly and it tells you, oh, this tone is very aggressive or it's very formal or it's very informal, that's an example of text classification where you have text coming in and then it's, it's giving you a category for that text. Other example, machine translation. So that's things like Google Translate. Autocomplete and Smart Compose. That's things like um, Gmail. Maybe even things like Copilot, where you're coding with an assistant. That could also be considered an NLP application. Um, there are also virtual assistants, Siri, Cortana, Google Assistant. Um, maybe all of this gets to replace just with a ChatGPT-like um, assistant.
So I hope that gives you a feel for um, NLP applications and um, what I'll look at in this little video series.